Well, good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the future of conservatism. We're looking forward to a very interesting and engaging discussion this morning about core principles of conservatism, the practice of conservatism, the policies that represent and advance conservatism, and the politics of conservatism, how to move forward uh, from here. I am Bill Shireman. I am the president and CEO of the Future 500. We're a nonprofit group that uh, many of you may not have uh, been familiar with before today. Our focus is on bringing together groups that love to hate and demonize each other. We primarily work between global corporations on the one hand and activist groups on the other hand. We're the ones that come in when there is a, a, a large oil company, for example, in battle with a grassroots activist group or a consumer brand company uh, 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 battling over human rights and labor rights issues in factories. Uh, we enter into those battles, which are often at the issue-specific area where there's a problem, and we try to raise all of the parties to look at systemic solutions that bring the sides together. And so when we look to systemic solutions, we tend to find common ground between groups that consider themselves progressive, liberal, conservative, libertarian, and so on. We are not an ideological organization. We're not left or right. Uh, but we do favor systemic solutions to problems. And when we talk about systemic solutions, that brings free markets into the conversation. We believe that free markets are a driver of solutions to problems systematically, so long as problems, if you, are, are, if you will, are owned in the marketplace, markets tend to drive those problems down. And so we find great value in applying principles that we find in the conservative movement and in the libertarian movement to problems that are often raised in the liberal and progressive movements as well as across the board on the right. We find, in short, that many of the problems that are identified by the left are legitimate, but many of the solutions are best found if you look on the right. And so bringing those two communities together is more and more vital. Myself, I am a Republican. I've been a lifelong Republican since uh, I think it was the day after I turned 18, went down to the Sunnyvale City Council and, and, and registered. And it takes real dedication to be a Republican in San Francisco, where it's practically illegal uh, to be a Republican. And I'm constantly involved in discussions with people who have discovered this secret fact about me and say, are you really? Are you really a Republican? You work on social issues and human rights issues and environmental issues, and they don't care about those things. They care about, they care about profit, profit, profit. So, um, but I'm a Republican because I deeply believe in the principles of enterprise and personal initiative uh, and, and uh, personal responsibility, not because I want to be uncompassionate toward people, but because I think when you vest people with the capacity to discover and use their power, they, they find incredible value that they can add to society, and that's, and that's what I want to see. Um, American support for what I consider to be core conservative values, individual freedom, personal responsibility, innovation, entrepreneurship, self-reliance, is higher than ever. If those beliefs translated into party affiliation, and if the Republican Party were conservative in that, in that frame, Republicans would outnumber Democrats two to one or more. But as polling by the college RNC and others have found in recent months, the conservative and the Republican brands have been badly damaged in the past few years, badly damaged. And maybe I see this more in San Francisco because of where I come from, so it's, it's a particularly hot seat to be sitting in there. But among young voters, more than 50% want to be entrepreneurs in their lives now. And that number is 58% for young blacks and 64% for young Hispanics. They want to be entrepreneurs. Overwhelm overwhelmingly, the millennial generation uh, is 
uh, believes in self-reliance, believes in dynamic change. They grew up in the internet era. They believe that society will continue to change and adapt. And so they are, I think, receptive to core Republican principles. Those core principles don't need to change. But the policies and priorities of the party do need to be updated on marriage, on immigration, uh, on environment, in order to win and earn the support of women, young voters, Hispanics, environmentalists, and others. These are not just ists. These are not just groups of people who behave as a single unit, as some in the Democratic Party may believe. These are complex individuals who have many priorities that are in some, sometimes aligned with these labels that we give them and sometimes aligned with them as people as a whole. And the Republican Party and the conservative movement has the capacity to treat people as individuals, not as, uh, as, as generic groups. And that's something for us to champion. Um, if conservatives and Republicans are not able to win higher support from the young, from women, from Hispanic voters in the future, then sometime between 2014 and 2020, it will become virtually impossible for Republicans to win national elections. So the need for change is absolutely clear. We are hopeful that this kind of change can be uh, planted through events like this and through follow-up discussions, and we invite you to participate in the discussion today in an interactive format. This isn't a teaching and learning situation. This is a mutual discussion and learning opportunity, but we also invite you to continue on with us afterwards. I would like to pass the mantle on to Stephen Jordan, uh, who will carry us into the first session this morning. So please welcome Stephen. Sure. Question. Yes. We, is this an on the record meeting? That's a very good question. And, you know, we do have uh, some media here. So, it would, so uh, uh, be aware that it could be picked up. Uh, but we do want to have within, that, within those confines as open a discussion as possible. Mm -hmm. If you have a question that you'd like to raise that you don't want to necessarily be associated with, I am happy to take a question and relate it to the, uh, to the to the folks here and raise it as an issue. And, and also a question about, what about um, tweeting today? Shall we back off? Uh, go for it. Yeah, I think you go should for go it? for it. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Only say wonderful things. No, it's say, say what's on your mind. Yeah, exactly. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Stephen Jordan. I'm president of the New World Institute. And first of all, uh, I really want to thank you, Bill, uh, and Future 500 for sponsoring this uh, tremendous event today. I think that um, uh, so often we get caught up in kind of the immediate and the urgent that the important sometimes gets uh, uh, under discussed. Um, with me today, I'm very pleased, in addition to Bill Shireman, CEO of Future 500, to welcome Dan McCarthy, editor of uh, the American Conservative, and Charlie Hurt, um, political com columnist for the Washington Times and uh, uh, contributing editor to the Drudge Report. And uh, this morning, what we'd like to do is uh, understand from the media's perspective, from people who've been covering the conservative movement, the, the current trends, the future goals, and, and where, where we see conservatism going today. But before we begin, one of the things that, that I'd like to share is that, is that I believe, personally, that we are coming very, very close to a new inflection point. The United States, historically, has had political paradigm shifts every 30 to 60 years. When you think about 1800 and the election of Jefferson and the advent of democratic republicanism. That was a sharp break from the federalist system before. 1860, 1861 clearly was a sharp break from what had happened before. 1932, another very sharp break. 1980, another sharp break. And what these, what these breaks do is that they end up being a way for the American political system to adjust to a new framework and to, to kind of realign its political discourse to the facts, to the changing patterns that exist in, in a different era. Now, in 1980, 1981, the Soviet Union was uh, the, the United States' largest competitor. There were three 
national networks plus PBS. The American GDP was about $3 trillion. We thought that the Mujahideen were great, were freedom fighters fighting against Afghanistan. And uh, we, were, we were very concerned about uh, getting the government out of uh, particular industries and deregulating and, um, and creating some openings. Following that political shift in the 1980s and 1990s, we had uh, almost unprecedented prosperity. And the same thing actually happened in the previous uh, political shifts as well. After the 1860 realignment, you had a situation where they called it the Gilded Age. So much wealth was created. You know, um, when you look at what happened after 1932, that, that didn't work so well in the short term. But by 1950, again, you had an unprecedented burst of prosperity. So one of the things that I also believe is that technology is accelerating political change. And so even though it hasn't been 60 years, today, Soviet Union is no more. We're now, ex we're now looking at a world where you have China, the European Union, <laughs> India, Brazil. You have all of these different players that in 1981 wouldn't have even gotten into the State of the Union address. The federal government is now the size of the GDP of the United States in 1981. You now have over 500 channels. You've got, in, you've got the rise of the internet. You have Fortune 500 companies like Google and Facebook that didn't exist seven years ago. In other words, the pace of change, the technology, the acceleration, the, the things that are going on are so fundamentally different that I would submit that we are on the cusp of a, of a real interesting, interesting change. The other thing, even though this is um, not intuitive, is the fact that we're going through this grinding period that we're seeing in our American political system is very reminiscent of like the 1970s and the 1850s. When, and the period between 1929 and 1932 is like, like this real grinding situation happens in American politics from time to time. And I know it causes a lot of distress while you're in it, but in a way it could be a harbinger of saying, okay, we're gonna get to a new, a new political construct here going forward. So what I'd like to do is, first of all, I'd like to ask each of you, you know, um, give us a little bit of an introduction, Dan, into, into the American conservative yourself, and also a little bit about how you see the current conservative landscape. And then I'm gonna just go down the line and, and ask our other guests the same questions. Well, thank you, Stephen. Uh, the American Conservative magazine was started in uh, 2002, in part in an effort to get ahead of the curve on some of these uh, changes, which were already in the offing even uh, a decade ago. Uh, and in part, what that meant was realizing that the right in 2002 and 2003 was still following a sort of Cold War set of attitudes. And even though by that point, uh, nobody wanted to support the Mujahideen anymore, uh, it was very clear that um, our overall approach to the war on terror was framed or formed by uh, this idea that a military stance derived in part from you know, the way that conservatives had wanted and oftentimes to fight uh, the Cold War, even though they often didn't really get the chance to do it the way they had wanted. Um, but it was shaped by experiences that had gone back you know, 40 years and that really were not the right way to react to the new situation that was confronting us after 9-11 and uh, with the uh, incipient dangers of uh, the Middle East. We're always awesome at fighting the last war. Exactly, <laughs> fighting the last war. And that was very clear with uh, respect to uh, the war on terror. And it was also clear that uh, economically, we had seen um, the advent of what some people have called casino capitalism, and that, uh, that there was a real estate bubble uh, cropping up. And in 2003, we actually wrote a, a, a cover story about the real estate bubble. Um, so uh, trying to get ahead of a few of the things that were clearly developing in a dangerous uh, trajectory uh, even a decade ago was one of the things that the American conservative uh, was uh, founded to do. And things that the, oftentimes the right and other conservatives were either oblivious to or even were uh, sort of uh, pushing along in the wrong direction. Thank you. Um, Charlie, you um, had, had worked at the Detroit uh, newspapers during a, a time of, of real interesting decay <laughs> in some ways. And then you transition from looking kind of at this micro 
set of problems to really covering some of the leading political figures of our time in the, the last couple of political campaigns. Uh, yes, <laughs> What's the, this been like for you? Uh, it's funny, um, I grew up in a small town in, uh, in Southside Virginia and uh, you know, I've always been loved newspapers and, and uh, loved the idea of exposing wrongdoing, uh, especially among pu uh, with public officials. Uh, and uh, w as Stephen said, we went out to Detroit. Uh, actually, it was in the middle of a strike, and uh, and I didn't know what a union was. Um, I guess I'd read about them, but uh, certainly didn't really care about them. And uh, and so I went out there as a uh, strike breaker, also known as a scab and uh, proudly worked there for uh, about seven years. But it was fascinating, and, and then uh, I came here in, uh, actually I, I came here five days after 9-11, uh, right after uh, my wife and I had our first child, uh, which was sort of a um, kind of odd timing. But, uh, so I come at all of this from, a, from a, I think, a slightly different perspective. You know, I, I went to college and I um, you know, studied classics and studied political philosophy, and, and have a basic understanding of, of the, I would say I studied the founding and appreciate the founding of this country. Um, but, uh, but really, uh, come, you know, being here in DC for the past 10 or 12 years and seeing the process up close and seeing uh, the massive forces that are at play uh, that, that, and this is what really disturbs me about all of it, is that the farmer uh, that I, you know, grew up or worked for uh, as a little boy back home uh, is so much at the mercy of the federal government uh, that for him to, to build a, a cow pond, a pond for his cattle to, to, to get uh, water from, or a pond in order to, uh, to, to, to uh, use uh, irrigation to, uh, you know, to, to water his crops. If he tries to do that and the EPA catches him, he will wind up in court. He will wind up, uh, uh, they will put him out of business. And, uh, and of course, you know, the big farming operations, that, that's great with them. They have no problem with that, uh, you, know, you know, major corporations. <coughs> and in every sector in Washington, uh, no matter what the topic is, it is that person back home who, is, uh, who, who should be free uh, to, to do what, what he knows is best um, is completely, uh, you know, left out in the cold and, and at the mercy of, of uh, n not only the government, a blind government, I would argue, uh, but also uh, major corporations. So, um, so that, that has been sort of what, uh, more than anything else, has, has kind of shocked me. Now, you, you covered uh, the campaigns of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Do you think that conservatives understand them? Um, no, largely because, uh, and Stephen, you, you and I have talked about this, about, uh, with President Obama, um, you, you know, they're speaking sort of a short line. You know how, how like, uh, you know, we've had good conservatives uh, who they, they, you can speak a shorthand and people get it, and, I, and I'm not talking about the dog whistle politics, I'm talking about when you talk about freedom or you talk about faith in a certain way, people understand what you're talking about. Well, President Obama does that very much. When he talks about things, uh, uh, the, a whole segment of the population gets it, and they know what he's talking about, and they like him. Uh, and clearly, conservatives don't get that. Um, and it's been a real problem because uh, they've run circles around conservatives. Uh, but one thing that I think is interesting is you were talking about this, this grinding, this uh, period of grinding that we're in right now. And I, not obviously... The, not the first time we've gone through it. No, either. it is not. And, and, uh, and usually, as you point out, uh, what comes of that, and it's painful at the time, and it seems like nobody is listening, and nobody is listening, everybody's just shouting. Uh, but everyone thinks this is just a really bad time and everybody needs to sit down and, and listen to Obama or whatever. Uh, but what I think is interesting is that, that, uh, that what follows that usually is a sort of coming together and somebody, someone is able to break through all of this. Well, you know what? The left has had their opportunity. And they had their opportunity with a, with a tremendous transcendent leader, Barack Obama. And he has totally failed to execute it into anything. 
I mean, it, when you look back at this, uh, especially if Obamacare goes the way I assume it will go uh, in 10 years, it will have collapsed. Um, his presidency will have been a total failure. And I say this not as someone who wants it to be, but as, as, as just an observer, that he has completely failed to reach anyone that didn't agree with him to begin with. And so it just ma le makes me wonder if that doesn't mean that, that it, the next one isn't going to be Hillary Clinton. Uh, the, next one, the next transcendent sort of leader is probably likely to come from a different uh, party. Okay, two things for down the road that I want to circle back on is, two, you said, you know, that Obama's failed to capture the zeitgeist. But second, you've said that he and Hillary have run circles around conservatives. So there's, there's two real interesting uh, thoughts there that I want to, to pick up on later. But Bill, before we, we get to that, why, why have this forum? What, what, what's the presenting thing about ha talking about the future of conservatism from your perspective? Why, is this, why does this matter? There are so many, there are so many reasons that it, that it matters. I think from my standpoint, we are going through a time of fundamental, uh, uh, fundamental change. This is not a surprise to anyone in the room, but every institution of society is being transformed by new technologies and new ideas. And when that happens, we have two problems that, the, that affect the political process. One, just as you said, on the, the mental frame with which we approached terrorism was an old mental frame. Uh, it came from the Cold War. I think the mental frame that both the, the liberal, progressive, and the conservative, libertarian movements bring to us are based on old institutions that are no longer in existence in the way that they are assumed to have been. And so when we look at things like marriage, we look at it from an old institutional frame that doesn't match today's reality. And that's true on environment. When we look at environment and, and what we hear often from Republican leaders uh, because it works politically is, again, pitting the environment against the economy, which is an old frame. It's an out-of-date frame. It's not that it's not true. You know, the EPA does kill jobs. Too much regulation does kill jobs and does harm innovation and does harm the environment. It's not that it's untrue, but it sounds old-fashioned to young voters who assume rightly that the environment and the economy can both excel together and usually do, not always, but usually do. So when Republicans bring these old ideas uh, forward as if they represent cutting edge thinking, they sound old fashioned. And so young people who overwhelmingly believe in innovation and free enterprise uh, look to the Democrats for that, because, not because they think the Democrats have the policies, but because they think the Democrats believe in them. And yeah, the Democrats almost have the brand. The, the Democrats have the brand. The Republicans have, in some ways, the policies, but they need to update those policies. You know, when you look to, 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 uh, to institutions like marriage, again, I come from San Francisco. I was on BART a couple of weeks ago and somehow uh, got into a conversation about, uh, about um, uh, family with a, uh, a gay couple that happened to, happened to be there. And it stimulated them to, to just to, to express their concern about the loss of family values and, the, and, and how important it was to establish you know, committed, solid relationships. And they had read the data, and they, had, they, had, they, they understood the problem. They had kids themselves. And I, and I realized that here is a gay couple in San Francisco that is expressing deep, passionate support for for the institution of marriage and committed lifetime relationships. They believed in it more than many people, you know, many straight couples uh, did. I think the Republican Party needs to recognize that as institutions change, the principles uh, remain, but they take different forms. Well, before we get kind of into where we want to get to, let's kind of establish a baseline of where we are. What, what is the San Francisco perception of conservatism today? <laughs> <laughs> well, <coughs> you know, the, um, the College RNC did, did 
a poll uh, recently, and, and I'd encourage you to, to, to read it. I think it's quite, quite useful. Um, but what they found was that there is a set of uh, small R Republicans who, are, who find the Republican Party, you know, big R repugnant uh, to them right now. They uh, strongly believe in core Republican values, but the words that they used, and these are, these are voters who are basically conservative, but who voted for President Obama in the last election. And the words that they expressed that most frequently came to mind when they thought of Republicans were uh, old-fashioned, rigid, racist, um, outdated, or old, uh, yeah, I think it was, uh, it was one other term I'm not remembering, but these are the terms that they use, and I think that that's, that's the Republican brand in San Francisco. It's old-fashioned, it's rigid, it's outdated, uh, it, it doesn't understand technology, it doesn't understand social change, uh, and, uh, and of course, the fundamental is that it's just pro-corporate, not pro-small business, not pro-entrepreneur, not pro-change, but, but, uh, but pro-corporate. The other problem that that uh, brings, and it happens on both the right and the left, is that uh, you know we're in a town of vested interests here. We all have 100 vested interests, and I totally understand why vested interests follow the patterns that they do. But vested interest groups, as we all know, uh, use dog whistle language to attract supporters to policies that embed their vested interests. They do it on the right, they do it on the left. If you want to advance spending on military, you know, how, you know what words to use when something blows up around the world to generate support for increased military spending. If you want, uh, if you want to sell more uh, hospital care, you know the words to use that, that, that trigger the left to demand that a whole new population of people get health care and you know that in the political process, they're gonna get healthcare through the same old institutions by further embedding the power of those institutions. So both the left and the right operate according to this dog whistle pattern that simply embeds the power of vested interests. We need to change that, not because vested interests are evil, because we all are vested interests, but simply because we all have to come together and say, our old vested interests are different from our new vested interests. And that means the right and the left have to both look at vested interest control, at their own control, and challenge that. But are, isn't it safe to say the Democrats are far better at that than <laughs> Republicans? You mean rhetorically or, uh, yeah, or in a, practice? Yeah, no, 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 in, in practice, and actually like, uh, you know, establishing, uh, you know, communicating in that way. I think that they are able to communicate that they care about the values. If you look at Obamacare, for example, you know, here you've got a law that appeals to progressive impulses by saying we're gonna guarantee health care for more people, but was pressed through Congress by appealing to vested interest and ensuring that the service that was provided is provided by the same people who have always provided the service in essentially the same way, which means that costs will go up, which means that the system will decline. So, so Democrats have been very effective at, at trying to advance progressive ideals uh, but they've been trapped, just as Republicans have been, by a system that compels them to do so by paying off vested interests along the way. So, and, and, I, and I want to pick up on this idea of the stereotype versus the reality. So what, what Bill just said, old-fashioned, out-of-date, rigid, et cetera, what, what, how do you think conservatives see themselves? Well, I think there's something to be said for old being old-fashioned, being rigid, and being uh, out of date. Um, and, and the difficult thing is that uh, it's obviously not a, a popular thing to say. It's something that uh, you know um, college students might not want to hear it. Uh, they don't want to hear their parents lecturing them. They don't want to hear their grandparents lecturing them. Nevertheless, I think what gets lost in a sort of futuristic vision of the world uh, that both left and libertarians tend to promulgate is this sense that there's also a need for an anchor. There's also a need for stability and that people will, in fact, have certain uh, affinities, certain groups that they belong to that are not just purely sort of voluntaristic, moment to moment, shifting with the sands, but that in fact are a bedrock, a foundation upon which they're able to build their lives, not only socially, but also economically. The family is a, uh, an economic unit as well as a social unit. So I don't necessarily disagree with Bill when he talks about updating the way conservative, conservatism approaches uh, different groups of people who have been traditionally excluded by the right. 
But I do think that um, we don't want to overlook why we have this attachment to these old institutions in the first place and what service they continue to provide in their traditional forms. Uh, traditional forms which often have been badly damaged not by simply uh, what we call the left or by some sort of political effort, but by sheer neglect, by the fact that there's not enough uh, attention paid to what these institutions are supposed to be doing in the first place. And I think you certainly see that with marriage. For all the discussion that we see about gay marriage, whether it should be, whether it should not be, we see rather little attention paid to divorce rates and what affect them. And the fact that um, in many cases, uh, conservatives are right to be very concerned about marriage becoming just a contract, just like a handshake, when in fact uh, this is something that's meant to be a much more stable and uh, permanent institution, whether or not it includes homosexuals or whatever other group. So I think that's where conservatives are coming from. It's, it's a matter of feeling, oftentimes one of the reasons conservatives even resent some of these uh, sorts of discussions is because they feel as if their whole perspective is being overlooked and even demonized, being called racist and old-fashioned and so forth. And there really is um, a, 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 a core value that conservatives are trying to preserve here, which is not exclusively conservative. It's something that really should be uh, a concern for all Americans. So just as conservatives need to be much better at reaching out uh, to other groups, I think other groups need to understand that conservatives are not just fueled by hate. They actually have uh, concrete positive reasons for supporting the things that they do. Well, I, d I definitely want to get into kind of the, the goals um, down the road, but I really thought that you were going to go towards the conservatives feel like they're revolutionary, they feel like they're insurgent, they feel like they're countercultural, they feel... Charlie, um, I have to, in the interest of full disclosure, Charlie and my daughters are very, very good friends. And Charlie and I have uh, had to go have a glass of wine every now and then to, to kind of compare notes about some of these things. But, so, so Charlie, one of the things that we talked about um, before was um, this idea of the Tea Party and, you know, um, Ted Cruz and some of these guys feeling like, feeling really angry, feeling like that they didn't have a voice and that they, um, instead of looking at themselves as old fashioned, they looked at themselves as kind of almost revolutionary against what they see as the status quo. Paradoxically, conservatives sometimes don't even think of themselves as conservative in the sense of supporting the status quo. There's a big critique of that. Am, am I hearing you right, or was I, I wrong yeah. about no, that? No, 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 no. And uh, as we were talking about earlier, uh, and I may ruffle some feathers here, uh, uh, it's, this seems to be a real hot topic among conservatives uh, this week. But, you know, uh, um, I think that <laughs> this effort that Ted Cruz has to defund Obamacare by not defunding it in the Senate, which to me sound, just seems sort of crazy, although you, if you say that out loud uh, in public, you are pilloried as some sort of traitor to conservatives and, you know. But it, it is, it, if you're going to be honest about this effort, it is going to fail, uh, and either Ted Cruz knows that if he doesn't know that, that's really scary, because the reason I've always liked him uh, since the first time I've ever, ever heard him speak is because he is an adult and he is a constitutionalist. And if you are a constitutionalist and you think that filibustering a bill to defund Obamacare that you asked House Republicans to uh, pass uh, is going to defund Obamacare, you are crazy and you are not a constitutionalist. Uh, but as a political statement, I have no problem. I mean, I, I love the idea that he's bashing Obamacare and all that kind of stuff. But um, I, I think that, uh, and when you re and if you you read the uh, coverage of it, from especially on the right, uh, you know, people are uh, you know really going after anybody who try questions this strategy. But uh, and I think the reason is is because as Stephen was saying that you know, for so many people, uh, so many of us, we are so angry about, and have been so ticked off about what we feel like is the, the, um, uh, just the, the, the desecration of the Constitution, the uh, you know, utter uh, disregard for uh, everything that makes this country great for so many years uh, that uh, and we're so used to running around with our pitchforks and banging them on the ground and everything that now, that, and, and that's basically what 
Ted Cruz wants to do, and he's going to make tons of money and get even more followers, which I think is great. I want him to have money, and I want him to have followers. But that's what he's going on in the Senate floor to do, is to bang his pitchfork on the ground. And if anyone says, hey, guys, you know what? We've been banging our pitchfork for um, seven years now, and it would be nice to actually do something, I don't know, that succeeds. Uh, if you say that, the, the, everybody gets upset. They're like, wait, wait a minute. The, the, our, we, this is what we do. We bang our pitchfork. And it's like, OK, but let's do something else. Let's do something. Let's try something to, to actually like succeed at something. For example, do the thing where you delay Obamacare for a year. That would be really smart and be very effective. And, and you know what? A, a, and at least make Democrats in the Senate vote for that. Because do you think that Mark Pryor is going to vote against that? And if he does, uh, do you think he might feel a little bit of pain back home? It's, uh, but but, but we're, we're not doing that. Instead, we're just continuing with our anger. And it's, at some point, we have to. So yeah, Dan, what, what do people think about the status quo? And what do you think about Bill's comment that um, conservatives um, represent corporatists and special interests? Well, Bill is very right. Um, I'm reminded when I look at the uh, conservative movement today and when I look at the right today of the left as it was 20 years ago. Uh, when Rush Limbaugh first became very popular, he was pillorying the right, uh, for the, uh, rather, he was pillorying the left for things like what he called symbolism over substance. And that's exactly what you're seeing with these uh, Ted Cruz theatrics right now. The right has become so hung up on a set of attitudes about authority and about being rebellious that it has totally overlooked the actual substance of what's going on in policy making. And that was even true in a different way during the Bush years, where you had less of a sense of rebelliousness on the right, but nevertheless you had a sense of um, you know, being on the team, having to support policies without really regard for whether these were good policies. If uh, Medicare Part D had been proposed by a Democrat, the conservative movement would have absolutely opposed it. But instead, when it was uh, proposed by a Republican, you had kind of lukewarm opposition, you had a lot of confusion, and it ultimately passed a Republican Congress. So I think, uh, you know, um, what we've just heard is completely correct. This is, um, you have a detachment here between a set of attitudes and an actual policy process, an actual serious effort at politics. Um, if you were to say what conservatism stands for today, who, what is that? What, who's the voice? What's the, you know, what are the top three things that you would say, okay, this is what conservatism is about? Well, it's, um, you have to be very careful in uh, engaging in hero worship. I think the right has been uh, misled for quite some time in being, uh, thinking that Ronald Reagan is the paradigm of every kind of political perfection, which is not true. Reagan was exactly the right person for the right time in the right place. Um, but that doesn't mean that he's, you know, this eternal figure uh, that we have to recur to all the time. I think right now you have some very promising people uh, in the Republican Party. I think someone like Rand Paul in particular is, on the one hand, uh, as principled as his father, but is also more practical than his father was and is trying very hard to translate, uh, you know, a, a core set of uh, principles uh, involving individuals and communities and decentralization and entrepreneurship and trying to take those principles, reach out to new populations with them, uh, such as his speak, uh, speech at Howard University, and not only that, but also trying to translate them into effective political action. Um, now, that's a great challenge. And whether he's going to succeed or not is something we're going to find out in the next several years. But he's the one, I think, most of all, who is moving in the right direction. Charlie, Bill, what do you think? What does conservatism stand for and who articulates it? You know, it, it's an interesting question because conservatism has been so contaminated as a, as a label, as has liberalism and progressivism, that it's almost impossible to adopt those terms. You have to fight so hard to convince people of your definition that you lose the political battle before you start. So I don't call myself a conservative or a liberal or a progressive for that matter, but I believe in certain things that I would consider in this room to represent conservatism, and that is uh, free enterprise, individual initiative, personal responsibility. Those are the kinds of things that I embrace. And I think that those are ideas that are exciting on with many who currently side with the left because they believe that the Democratic Party is more at heart in alignment with those principles, even if in terms of policy, they don't seem to be going anywhere with it. Yeah. That's, what, that's what Republicans have to work on. And the challenge, 
that we see every day in our work between corporations and activist groups is that pragmatically in all political battles, the, the first and easiest strategy to use to win is to demonize the other side. So in battles between corporations and activist groups, the activist groups demonize the companies quite consciously. They, they strip them of their humanity, treat them as if they're machines, mechanistic and, 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 and damaging. Uh, and, and, we, and our job in engagement is to bring actual people together and break the myth of the demon. Yet they love Apple. And they love, they love Apple, which is interesting. And so certain, certain companies, Apple and before them Toyota, were immune to this demonization. Now at a certain point they become vulnerable to the demonization. But basically, once a demon, always a demon. So it's always, you know the companies that come to mind when you think of the classic uh, corporate demons. Uh, uh, but what needs to happen in the, uh, uh, on the conservative side, as well as on the progressive side, is that people from within those communities need to bring people from the other communities in and break that demon psychology. That's what people hold on to. They want you to say the other side is a demon, and they want you to believe it and show it. Uh, and uh, you can't convince them otherwise. You have to bring them into a room and where they discover each other's humanity. When they do, we find that the right and the left can come together because they both recognize that something revolutionary has to happen. That the hold of old mental uh, frames, which takes real form in lobbying, uh, has to be broken. Not because these vested interests are evil, but because they're holding us back collectively. And they all, or most of them, will advance better if they all can let go of those, those interests. You know, um, Charlie said something that was interesting here, is that, that a lot of folks, and I think Dan echoed this as well, is that a lot of conservatives don't feel respected. In your process, you know, when you have a Sierra Club and, a, and, a, and an energy company, both sides may not feel respected yeah. either. How, is, how, how do you start to build up respect? I think, first of all, we individualize. <laughs> you know, these groups think of each other as giant groups, all monoliths. Uh, so we, we, you know, we, do, we go through a process where we inventory the, the stakeholders on all sides, and then we profile them as individuals. Here's somebody from this oil company who has something in common with you. You really want to meet this person. Here's someone from this, from this you know, supposedly radical activist group that actually believes in something that you're doing, you need to meet that person. And so it's a person-to-person -person, uh, uh, engagement that happens. That tends to break the, the mythology of the monolithic opposition, and it gets people to actually engage with one another. And we find that it takes about six months to two years, but that the demonization campaigns then peter down to nothing because, because the ideological rigidity has been blown apart by meeting with one another. Now, it happens, it's interesting, the first time you engage, you usually, you often have a very positive meeting. People are just amazed at, my gosh, I talked to this person, I thought he was the devil, turned out to be really good. They go back to their communities and say, I had a really good <laughs> meeting with the devil this morning, and they say, are you crazy? You, you have been co-opted by the devil. And so the first person goes back and writes a press release condemning the devil again to, to, you know, to convince her, his or her colleagues that, that you know, he or she hasn't, uh, uh, hasn't uh, gone over to the dark side. And then, of course, the, the, the company, in this case, says, we're never dealing with them again. We had a nice meeting, then they, they, you know, they, they attacked us back. We have to counsel and you know, handhold through that process because it takes about six months for that to stop happening. And then the groups coalesce, and then they're in the real world, not the idealized world, and they actually can. So Charlie, um, I want to give you a chance to, to say a little bit about what you think conservative stand, conservatism stands for today and, um, and who ex is exemplifying that. But I'd also like to pick up on this last point of is this why you said that um, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were, were running circles around conservatives? Oh, yeah. It was it, um, very much so. What, 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 what President Obama was able to do, and I, and I actually don't think Hillary is, is as good at it. Uh, obviously, she's not as good at it. Um, 
but what he did was he totally, that, that was a brand campaign. It was, he, he became an icon, he became a product. You know, during 2008, you know, we went everywhere, uh, uh, you know, and, and you know, he, he never talked about, I mean, I found him kind of appealing, actually, especially because the alternative was John McCain. I mean, I didn't vote for him, but well, I didn't vote for him simply because, I, you know, when you sit down and you, you make the list of things, I, I just didn't agree with, uh, you know, his worldview that the government is basically the answer to everything. But, um, but he was vague and uh, throughout all the entire campaign, but he was able to do those, do that branding and, do, and, and speak that shorthand uh, to all of the little different groups that uh, it was brilliant. And what's so strange about it now is, and we saw this in the, in the reelect, uh, but we see it increasingly now on a, you know, just when he gives speeches, he's angry a lot of the time. And he says things that are bitter and nasty, and he uh, condemns Republicans, you know, in Congress as only wanting to, I don't know what it is, they want to kill people or something? Why they don't support Obamacare? Because they're, you know, whatever he says, it's, it's a very pointed, these pointed attacks, and it's so nasty and divisive. And, I, and when I sit there and I think of, think of the, you know, watching the speech that he gave in Berlin, uh, you know, in, 2000, in the summer of 2008, and you're just like, Mike, where did that guy go? He's gone. He, that guy was uplifting. Even if you didn't agree with him, you sort of, you know, it was, but he's a, he's a totally different guy um, now that he's had to actually put, put uh, you know, uh, substance behind that brand. And he finds out that people don't like, a lot of people don't like the, the junk that he's filled his empty vessel with. Um, but I think it's easier for him to convey, right now, it's easier for him to convey anger because it reinforces the recalcitrant, do-nothing Republican theme. That these these yeah. Republicans are not going to do anything. It also creates an opportunity, though, that I think Republicans have not captured yet because it opens the door to the positive frame, to yes. the change-oriented frame. And, you know, something I learned a long time ago from a, from a, from a libertarian who was trying to, trying to uh, penetrate the progressive resistance to some of his ideas. And he said, before they care what we know, they need to know that we care. Mm. And that stayed with me ever since. The fundamental thing that I think Republicans need to do to be able to uh, reach those closet Republicans that, that could support the party, and it, take, it takes substantive change on the issues as well. But the first thing Republicans have to do is convey that they care about the objectives that, I'm sorry to say it, progressives care about. That they care about the environment, that they care about women, that they care about Hispanics, that they care about gay and lesbian citizens, and so on. Now, it's easy to trigger a negative from the Republican side for, a ver for very good reasons, because these are not cohesive groups of, of identical individuals, and Republicans resent the victimization of whole groups. But I think that if you look in the women's empowerment movement, for example, right now, which tends to be associated with the Democrats more than the Republicans, but the movement itself is not about victimhood. It's not about women being victims and needing society to swoop in to save them. It's about the power of women. And that's a movement that is resonant with core Republican values. But right now it's being abandoned by Republicans uh, because it's viewed as a democratic, you know, as a democratic vehicle and a pro-choice vehicle and so on. That's a missed opportunity. You know, um, uh, I've got so many pieces to pick up on here, it isn't even funny. But before we do that, I, I'd, I'd like to segue out and, and open up for, for any comments uh, from the audience at this point and, um, and see if there's anything in particular that, that you all would like to pick up on. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, my name is Nigel Ashford. I'm with the Institute of Humane Studies. We're a libertarian educational organization for students. I wanted to try and put together three things that Bill Sherman said at the beginning about finding market solutions to problems that the left have identified. Secondly, how do we appeal to the youth? And thirdly, that the environment, uh, although young people are skeptical about government, they think the government is the only solution to the environment. So two things I would say the future conservatives need to think about is one, 
We need to talk about free market environmentalism that we never, ever, ever, ever talk about, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even though there's a well-developed intellectual framework for that. And then secondly, at the coalitional level, we should look to things like the model of uh, the green tea uh, movement, that I think in North, North Carolina, I think, where the Tea Party have got together with environmentalists to try and increase competition in the energy area, reduce subsidies for conventional uh, energy sources. So that's one area where I think we can move a step forward from where we are now. Tremendous. Uh, absolutely true. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that you know, another of the missed opportunities of the, of the Republican Party right now has been the tendency to dismiss all of climate science because of the belief that if you accept climate science, you have to accept a big government solution to climate, uh, to climate problems. And I understand why this emerges. <clears throat> I, I totally understand. On the right, there is a commitment to decentralized power, to small business and entrepreneurial business and to competition. Then they recognize that central government action, while the left may idealize it as the way to finally push through justice and peace and, and environmental sustainability, that centralized government power actually leads to the opposite of those. That's an insight, that's a knowing that Republicans and conservatives have that progressives just don't get until they live it, until they experience it. When the Republicans completely sweep away climate science as if there is no basis for it whatsoever, they leave the entire field of play to the Democrats. And more than that, they leave the entire field of play to vested interests that collectively can wield majority Democratic support. And that means you do come through with an agenda that is a big government agenda where there are effectively takeovers of huge chunks of the economy. Republicans need to have an agenda on climate or they leave the field open to the Democrats and we will have a messy state by state uh, 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 proliferation of big government solutions that don't go anywhere. That's what's going to happen. Probably not a federal, not probably not a federal law, but thousands of state and local measures. Uh, to me, this is an extraordinary opportunity. The best approach, if you speak with conservative economists, to the climate issue is to shift taxes, as many of the people in the room know. It's an ideal opportunity for Republicans to actually do something, shifting down taxes on income, on payroll, on corporate profits, and shifting them up on pollution, on carbon, or if people don't want to believe carbon is a pollutant, then on a market basket of pollution. That's something that virtually every conservative economist knows is a good idea. It's good for the economy. It's good for prosperity. It's good for innovation. And over time, because pollution declines at about 1% or 2 or 3% a year, taxes decline at about 1% or 2 or 3% a year. So if Republicans actually believe in reducing taxes over time, reducing the power of government, reducing the power of the EPA to over-regulate the economy, then this is a natural for them. But right now, of course, dogmatically, it's not possible to even acknowledge climate as a legitimate issue. If the Republicans are to appear to be current to young voters, they're going to have to get over that in this next cycle. They're gonna to have to offer an alternative to the big government non-solution to climate. This gentleman here, this lady, and then that gentleman. Um, I think this kind of ties into the climate discussion that you just had, but when I heard people talk about what the state of conservatism is or what it means to be conservative, it seemed like I got very mixed messages up there. And, you know, I'm someone who believes words mean something, and conservative has always meant something to me. And I look back at Edmund Burke and Russell Kirk and, you know, those core conservative principles that, that they articulated. And if you look at all that and you take it all and then boil it down, really what conservatism was about back then and what the word means in my mind is it's really about stewardship. It's about looking after future generations. It's about not living for today. It's about being responsible. It's about all these things. But then I hear Dan talk about Rand Paul, which comes from a very libertarian school, um, Ayn Rand and so forth. And that seems in conflict with a lot of traditionalist conservative values. And so, on the libertarian side, I see less of that stewardship ethic coming through, and on the traditionalist conservative side, I, I 
I see that as sort of a, a center core value. But, but right now, the traditionalist ethics and values from, from back then and what conservatism, when it was really intellectual, was about, they don't seem to be in the discourse today. Instead, conservatism is being labeled as what you hear Rush Limbaugh say every day. Um, and in my view, a lot of those things are not conservative. Waste is not conservative. Uh, being irresponsible stewards is not conservative. So I just wonder how you rectify, you know, sort of this libertarian trend and this sort of depression of traditionalist conservatism as to how that fits with where conservatism is headed. Dan, this one seems one, like one for you. Well, I, I disagree somewhat with the uh, premise that Rand Paul is a pure libertarian. Uh, I think his father, even his father, had a certain sort of temperamentally conservative side, a Burkean temperament, if not necessarily a Burkean philosophy. And as a good Burkean, um, the temperament is at least as important as the philosophy itself. Uh, but Rand, in particular, has been working very hard to sort of broaden and humanize um, the libertarian philosophy. So, I mean, Rand Paul has uh, referred to himself as a crunchy conservative, uh, taking uh, an inspiration there from one of our writers, uh, Rod Dreher, who writes about um, sort of quality of life issues and why people are, you know, uh, concerned about local sourcing of food and things like that. So while I wouldn't want to present Rand Paul as being necessarily an avatar of those kinds of ideas, uh, my, the, the fact that he's interested in them is encouraging to me. And I kind of hope that at some point, I mean, Rand Paul's a senator from Kentucky. Wendell Berry, who is a, a favorite of many agrarian conservatives, is, of course, a Kentucky farmer and Kentucky author. And I hope at some point they may be able to sit down and have a discussion, and I think you'd find a very interesting interplay of ideas. So one of the things I think that Burkean conservatives or libertarian conservatives on the other side that everyone needs to be aware of are the defects and the limitations of one's own position. So it's not enough simply to say, well, we have this uh, program, whatever label we want to give it, and it's flawless and it's going to satisfy everyone, because clearly that's not the case. There has to be some dynamic interchange, and I think Bill has spoken very eloquently to the need for dialogue with groups that might not otherwise be in communication. Well, that includes, among conservatives, dialogue between libertarians and Burkeans and Kirkians and other people who are traditionalists. Because ultimately it's going to, you know, we have to have a set of policies in this country that allow everyone to flourish, um, even though you have some very... Um, very different demographic groups in this country, very different ideological groups, very different regions. Uh, this is a country that has to have a pluralistic approach to the whole. It can't simply be one faction thinking that it's going to gain everything. Dan, long time. Going in a little different direction, I have three part. First, um, I totally agree with the comments here, but I would ascribe to something you said that actually there are some, I don't want to call them evil, but some intentions uh, to keeping certain issues alive and keeping the divide alive for money-making purposes. You know, when you talk about how uh, Cruz is going to get a bigger email list and more money and all that, and that's great, no it isn't. Because there's too much of that happening on some of the most divisive issues in the country where there are industries that have grown up on both sides of the issue and they have a vested interest keeping them alive and not coming together at all. So that is a problem. Second, speaking of which, Boehner and crew, they're not do nothing. They're not evil. And the conservative media, I would fault, has not given enough support to the stuff they have done that is good, that allows Obama to continue to say that they've done nothing. There's been no drumbeat. They don't even defend themselves, which drives me nuts. They think by having press conferences when they do certain things that everybody's going to recognize it and everything's going to be great. Well, no, the media ignores it. If it doesn't fit a narrative, it doesn't, doesn't get told. I've pled with the, with the party, with other groups, to please start doing some support to show people what they have actually done and that Reed is the one that's evil. He's the do-nothing. He's the one that sat on a lot of the stuff they've done. But hopefully the conservative media, if you pick up the drumbeat, yes, they have done a lot of things wrong, but they've also done a lot of things right. Somebody's got to defend those guys because that hurts the brand further. Third, women. Man, are you right. You say the word woman in conjunction with almost anything on the conservative side, they immediately say, oh, far left, you know, uh, ultra-feminist, you know, this is a destruction of, of uh, the world, you know, by letting these women go run amok. In uh, 1996, I was involved in the effort to move the suffrage statue from the basement of the Capitol up to the rotunda. I actually cut the deal. You would not believe we had to go into Gingrich and say, this is not some feminist plot. I mean, people were telling them they want to move the statue of women. Oh, it's the feminists. No, 
It was a coalition of over 100 groups ranging from the DAR and the Federation of Republican Women over to now. It's something they all agreed on. But you're right, as soon as they heard women, you know, a statue of women, ah, oh, this is evil. I said, the three women in the statue are Republicans. You got Republican women in the basement. What is your problem? And it took forever to get them to do it. And we have other efforts that we're trying to go forward that are nonpartisan to promote women, like women's history, that as soon as you, you know, say women, it's immediately evil left, you know, whatever. And it isn't. And we have got to get, you know, our uh, conservative leaders and Republican leaders have been gender blind and gender stupid. They really don't know how to talk to women unless they're women that exactly parrot back what they say. We've got to get the boys over this. We've got to teach them some social graces and, and how they can actually talk to women so they can get out of the corner where they stand with their pocket protectors talking to each other and start to actually ask the women to dance and, and, and have some intelligent conversations with women without thinking that they're left-wing loons. This, this gentleman in the back. But before he says something, Charlie, what do you think about the role of conservative media in, um, in uh, addressing these, these stereotypes? I, I, I think you make an excellent point about, um, you know, it's, uh, about the fact that Mitch McConnell and Boehner and crew have actually done a whole lot more than they get credit for. Um, and one of the things that I uh, find myself, and, and I believe in, you know, tearing into to Republican establishment <laughs> with, with the best of them. But I, I do think it's worth noting that under, you know, what Boehner has done in the House uh, in terms of ending earmarks, uh, I mean, that is extraordinary. I mean, it's just mind-blowing that there, there, there was a, a Speaker of the House that made that determination after decades and decades of just raping the taxpayer. And they cut their budgets by 15% without being forced. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, and, 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 and the thing that, that the, the Tea Party conservatives, and I love these people, overlook is uh, that because John Boehner has insisted on regular order in the House, he has done more to protect the minority. And by minority, yes, we're talking about the Democrats, but the bigger minor, the biggest minority, or the most mi minor minority, of course, is the, are the conservative groups in the House. They are allowed to squall and vote however they want on everything. And it makes it look sort of ridiculous sometimes because they put things on the floor and they don't have the votes, uh, which is a problem. But it is, he has done more to protect that minority than, than any speaker that, that I can point to in the past 50 years. So I, I agree that that, that, is, um, that that does get overlooked. And, and uh, but I also think it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where you 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 still have um, you can't reason with a lot of us don't can't be reasoned with because we're still so we feel so burned and so um, misled and and abused because of the good faith that that we you know we the good faith we uh, had in Republicans previously. Only to be, um, you know, I, I was reminded and remi often remember uh, this was back when uh, DeLay was uh, major uh, majority leader. I guess this was in the, uh, what, 2003, 2004 time frame. And Nancy Pelosi had gone on some tear about something just crazy, crazy talk. And, and, and in that way that only she can do. And you're just like, what is going on here? And I remember talking to this guy, he was one of the top guys for delay, and, and I said, why, why is it that you all don't take out Nancy Pelosi? She's just, she's crazy, she's ludicrous. And you, if, if you all actually made like a national campaign about what an insane person this is, um, you all could, really, it would be great for you. And he said, oh, Charlie, Charlie, are you kidding me? She's our best weapon. As long as she's there, they'll never get in the majority. And every time I look at her now, it's, uh, all through her speakership, I, was, I, I kept thinking about that guy and the arrogance of it. And so, um, and so I think that, so I, you're right. But, but obviously, uh, for a lot of people, you know, the, the, we're just, we remain really bitter at these people. And these people, I mean, establishment GOP. Over here and then here, and then I want to shift to another segment. 
Michael, uh, Michael Osterlink. Can you speak about being free market but not holding uh, the efficiencies of the market as your highest value in terms of your personal life? I'm thinking like th when you buy locally food or other products or one, one of the spouses decides to stay home, although they can make a lot more money and raise the children and homeschooling, there seems to be a lot of movements among certain segments of the, of the conservative movement that is free market but doesn't live in a free market efficiency type of way. Who wants to take that one? You mean, is there a contradiction between advocating free markets and not living? Well, in it's interesting because if you listen to people talk about it in the popular press, yeah. if you're free market, you have to be, you have to support efficiencies in all areas of one's life. Yeah. But I see that people can be free market and yet live differently than what you would imagine you know, the efficiencies the market would encourage one to do. And conservatives don't seem to do a good job of expressing that you can, that you can make those distinctions. It's a great point, and it's absolutely true. Um, so obviously, self-responsibility is one of the other sides of this. It's not simply about, um, and self-determination, self-government. It's not simply about efficiency, making the most money, you know, having a bottom line. It's also about, um, especially in the case of the food rights movement, which wants to have, uh, you know, w wants to avoid some of these absolutely um, atrocious regulations, which are really just designed for massive factory farms. If you have a small farm that's producing or organic uh, products, um, the regulations will kill you. I mean, just because it's a totally different kind of operation. Well, the reason why, um, you know, many conservatives, uh, libertarians, localists, people on the left even, are concerned with this kind of, uh, this, this kind of small-scale free market is because it's, it's a quality they want. It's something that, for ethical reasons, for um, reasons of just sort of personal health, for reasons of personal self-government, they want these kinds of products and not the products that are sort of prepackaged and freeze-dried, regulated and inspected uh, by USDA. So absolutely, there's much more to uh, the argument for free markets, and I think a more powerful argument in some ways uh, than efficiency, and that's the argument in favor of self-determination, self-government, and choice. Huge opportunity there that you're talking about. Huge opportunity. There are so many, you know, in, in San Francisco, so many small-scale entrepreneurs that are hemmed in by over-regulation at the city level. I speak with them all the time, and they're on the left and they're on the right uh, uh, politically, they need liberation from that. We have this old, industrial, decades-old approach to, system, to, to, in, to industrializing everything and making everything the same. And on the left, you have a tremendous pent-up demand to change. And if the Republican Party can, can tap that, even in San Francisco, if the Republican Party were out there demanding competition to yellow taxi with, you know, with all the shared vehicle services and so on and all the shared economy uh, 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 enterprises that are emerging, you'd see people saying, my gosh, I'm going to become a, a San Francisco Republican. Maybe it's a little different, but I'm going to become a San Francisco Republican because they're liberating me to pursue the kind of food that I want, the kind of lifestyle that I want, to do things with my property that don't fit into the codes and so on. Big opportunity there. But you can't talk about efficiency and you can't talk about free markets in that, in that regard. You have to speak the language that comes from them and then draw them in and they will believe in free markets once they understand that you're not talking about corporate control. Okay, last one and then I want to move on to the next section. Um, Catherine Sirks, um, I, I really I really agree with what Bill said. I think you really hit something is that the Democrats identify problems and we tend to have really good ideas on solutions and but we don't listen to each other because if the if the uh, if the uh, observation of the problem comes from the left, then we don't want to hear about it. We we toss it off as a lefty thing. When we talk about solutions, even when we're talking about saying things like gee, there are problems with big corporate with with corporate cronyism, they don't hear it. They don't want to hear it because it's come from us. So we're at we're at these you know crossroads of of missing each other. Um, when we, if we hook up, it's like the difference of of the Tea Party versus, and the Occupy movement um, had each had a piece of the puzzle. Occupy movement was identifying the problems with corporations. Tea Party identifying the problems with government. When the real thing was that it's when government and corporations get together, then we're all screwed. Right. And if we, you know, we kept trying to get Tea Party people together with Occupy. But what I want to go to is this issue of, you know, it's this sort of us versus them mentality. And you're all, some of you are using Republican and conservative interchangeably. Mm 
as though the Republican Party was the conservative movement. Um, for good or for bad, that's not necessarily true. And I think that may, it may not be a good thing because so many of us are, are very um, quick to point out that we're conservatives, not Republicans. But I think the whole thing with health care, um, like, for example, health care is a good example of that solution thing. In 94, Republicans had a chance, after defeating Hillary Care, to do something wonderful, but wouldn't acknowledge that the system had problems because it was, the, it was Hillary who had said there were problems. But now what we've got is Cruz, now I'm getting into process, is, is Cruz is, is trying to do something to negotiate. Let's say he's playing hardball to negotiate. Um, but the Republican establishment is jumping on him. The re conservatives are jumping on the Republican establishment. And we're at as much cross purposes as though we're liberals and conservatives. Um, now, I don't see that coming on the Democrat side. So when Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi pulled a real procedural um, um, switcheroo in 2010 on health care, there, everybody from their side stayed with them. Now when Ted Cruz is trying to do that um, and say, look, I'm using this as a negotiating tool, he does not believe that. He's trying to get them to negotiate to the point to delay. Um, and, but they won't stand behind him. So we're doing, it, we're doing the us versus them as much within the conservative Republican dynamic as we are in the, in the macro picture. So the, what leads me to is I, I'm, I'm not ready to go out and identify myself as a Republican. How do we get over that hurdle? Um, because we still have a big gap be between us. And you know, just, just picking up on that point a little bit, it's been declining in recent years. But historically, anywhere between 30 and 40 percent of Democratic voters self-identified themselves as conservatives. You know, um, and it wouldn't be a bad thing if conservative principles were bought by both parties in some ways and yeah. things like that. But you, the, second, the second element of what you just said uh, it kind of reminds me, in the 90s, um, do you remember that old joke, um, I'm not a member of any organized party, I'm a Democrat? <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds very much like what the Republicans have decided that they want to imitate the Democrats on in, in that regard. So um, some very, very interesting feedback so far. Let me, let me switch gears on you and let's say, what, what are conservatives doing right that they should be building on? Choice. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, easy to kind of deride the folks that live in, uh, live in think tanks. Uh, but I think that we find a lot of fascinating solutions in the conservative think tank community. Uh, and, and those solutions are often cast in the language of the 1970s, let's say, uh, and very much appeal backward in time in the language it's used. But the ideas themselves are very much alive. I, I think that what Republicans have done by putting educational choice on the table is extremely important. It runs against the deep you know, democratic uh, uh, power that groups like the teachers unions and the education establishment have, another vested interest. These are not evil people, they're not bad people, they're just doing what the system dictates that they do, which is to advance their parochial interests ahead of the broader public interest. Uh, and they have been successful in preventing the Democratic Party from a, to a great degree from recognizing that schools have to adapt, they have to change, and that people deserve some choice. So I think Republicans are very good at putting charters on the table and putting vouchers on the table. They probably need new terms and new language you know, to deal with things that have, that have been, um, uh, that have been uh, uh, corrupted there. Coupons, there you go. <laughs> I mean, it, it's true. In San Francisco, it's a ludicrous system that we're involved in there, and, and certainly more choice makes more sense. More use of the market the ownership principle, but not referring it to the ownership principle. Uh, you know, stewardship is the, is the key. 
The ownership principle to the left implies corporate control and materialism. That's not what the right means by ownership. They mean taking personal responsibility. That's something the left can actually embrace. Taking personal responsibility is what they're about. But when they think of it, they think of it as stewardship, not as ownership. So these terms that are used on the right are offensive to people on the left because they define them differently. If we begin to talk about stewardship and making sure that when people do harm to society, they're held accountable for that harm through things like shifting taxes from you know, prosperity to actual harm, to pollution, then you're embedding Republican principles in a system where people can, can, can finally relate to the party. Um, Dan, uh, you and I have talked about this um, a couple of times. Is conservatism an inclusive ideology to Anne's, Anne's point? Are there people that are, are trying to build a big tent? Fusion conservatism w is a real thing, isn't it, or not? Well, it is. Um, I, I would say that any kind of conservatism, and there certainly are gradations, there certainly are differences among conservatives, some with a libertarian emphasis, some with a traditionalist emphasis, um, you know, and, and you can break it down even beyond that. Um, I would say that you know, each of these groups has to be capable of working with the others. So it's not a matter of adopting wholesale somebody else's principles. It's a matter of being able to have a dialogue with people and being able to uh, form coalitions as, you, as needed and also dissolve them when appropriate. So I think one of the things that uh, conservatives are doing right at the moment is having discussions like these, especially uh, with some of the questions and answers that we've had. Um, there's a, a, a willingness, I think, on the right, or at least parts of it, to re-examine the things that have happened in the past decade, or for that matter, in the past 40 years or so, and start to think about how do we apply our principles to a world that is very different, that has changed a great deal uh, from the one uh, you know, that Ronald Reagan was confronting in the late 1970s. Um, and so I'm encouraged in that, and, and I'm encouraged also that you seem to be seeing uh, a development of, of different sort of philosophical perspectives among especially some of the House Republicans. So I think some, some, someone like Justin Amash is creating ideas and creating perspectives that are radically different from either the received wisdom of movement conservatism where people are, are walking in lockstep uh, with regard to the national security state. And Justin Amash has been confronting that. But you also see um, a number of uh, conservatives in the House who, have, uh, who are looking very seriously at uh, problems of uh, corporate cronyism, for example, and uh, other such things that traditionally have been sort of taboo topics uh, for, for the right, or at least have been taboo for a generation or so. Um, so I think that sense of dynamism and, and self-examination is uh, one of the conservative movement's uh, strengths, even though it's something that has been suppressed for uh, all too long. So Charlie, I mean, observing these political campaigns and observing the things that, that you have, what, what advice would you give to conservatives in terms of building up where what what kind of, of strategies and tactics would you recommend to say okay this is this is where conservatism uh, should be thinking about going well I agree with Bill and Dan about what about conservatives are very good at, at talking about the stuff and, and sort of coming up with new ideas and and they're intellectually honest by and large um, which is something that is pretty uh, pretty well lacking I think on, on, on most of the other side. Um, and, you know, it's people like Rand Paul, Ted Cruz, um, you know, the, 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 these, the, the, it's very, it's a positive thing that they're out there talking. But, you know, I, I think of myself as kind of a dumb guy. And, uh, and I can listen to Rand Paul for a certain amount of time. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to have, they're going to have, they, what was so great about Ronald Reagan was was not just that he was conservative and, and perfect for that time and, and everything, but he was a sunny guy and he was and he told a story. Every time he made an argument, it was a story that he told, and it was a story of freedom, and it was a it was a hopeful, optimistic thing. And he was an actor and he was good at it, and he appealed to people. In even if you didn't agree with him. You know, it's interesting, you, you know, today people try to vilify him a little bit. Well, you didn't try to vilify him at the time. He was, he was a very appealing guy. And as much as I like Rand Paul, I don't, he doesn't have that sort of, he, he's, he's, he's a guy you would sit and hang out with. He's not a, he's not a over, you know, high arching uh, storyteller. 
Uh, Ted Cruz is a really morose looking guy. When you talk to him, he seems like, he just seems like sad. And, and I, think that that's, I think that's a very bad thing. And, 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 so, and so many people love to make fun of Sarah Palin. And you know, I get it. Uh, th there's, you know, you know, some of the things that she says, it's easy to sort of pillory. But at the end of the day, I remember being at the 08 convention, and it was John McCain, and you're like, oh my god, this is just a train wreck. You knew where it was going. And, and even if he won, it would have been a disaster. And, um, <laughs> And then, and then he comes up with the Sarah Palin thing, and she came out there and, uh, at the convention, and she spent the entire time pointing at us in the, in the press that, you know, and just used us like a punching bag. It was so awesome! And she, <laughs> the way she talked about conservatism in, in, in terms of her snow machine was really, really appealing. And, it was, and, and she got it, and, and maybe she didn't, Really know exactly where Russia was or how far away it was, but I don't. I, you know, I don't really care that much. I, the fact that she told the story of freedom so uh, hopefully and beautifully, um, in a way that I don't think Ted Cruz and uh, and and some of these other guys can. So I guess the end of my point is that, and until we find that person, we're we're going to be spending a lot of time sitting around thinking of good ideas and so talking about them. we're still going to be grinding through the grinding. intermediate, the grinding, intermediate yeah. step. So my takeaways from that is be upbeat, tell the story of freedom, and use the press like a punching bag. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Precisely. Is that right? And, 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 and like t t we were talking about, the, talking about the gay marriage thing, you know, conservatives or whatever have gotten into this thing where, you know, by being against it, they wind up like denigrating people all the time, which is, is works for that like 20% over here, but it doesn't, it's not expanding the Bill, Bill, field. What, ad, what advice would you give for conservatives in terms of tactics and strategies? Well, uh, first of all, stay the course uh, in terms of change. You know, it's, it's interesting to me, as uh, President Obama won the last election, it wasn't as much a blowout as it's popularly now cast as. Uh, it, he, could have, he could have lost. President Romney could be in place. Uh, and the Democrats would be, would be gathered, you know, talking about the future of liberalism. Um, and, and in 2014, if the Republicans <laughs> happen to take the Senate, then all this talk of Republicans updating their, their party is going to fall behind until they lose in 2016. Uh, if they don't take the Senate, then the Republican self-examination will continue. Both parties are stuck two or three generations in the past. Both of them need to change. It's not just the Republican Party that needs to. If the Republican Party is the first to change, it has the, the advantage. Yeah, somebody's so, going to win. <laughs> stay the course. No matter what happens in 2014, stay the course. Drive change in the party. That doesn't mean becoming Rockefeller Republicans. It doesn't mean taking a point halfway between liberal and conservative so that you appeal to the middle. It means embracing those core Republican values, but applying them in new, modern, forward-thinking ways. It means celebrating the principles that are embodied in institutions that are traditionally important and, and recognizing and explaining why those institutions hold and help to advance those values but not holding to a strict interpretation of the form of those institutions if that means really sacrificing the principles in the process. Understanding and valuing tradition is important. Holding to the forms of tradition when they've gone out of date uh, sacrifices the principles that are the most important part of them. I think, I think that you made some very, very valid points. One of the interesting things, if you look at the electoral map, what it really is is it's red states and blue cities. You have basically a one-party state in San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Washington, D.C., Detroit, where, where um, Democratic candidates are winning 70, 80, 90 percent of the electorate. And then in every single state, yeah. I think outside of the, the top two or three major urban areas, you're seeing Republican majorities. And this cleavage between rural and suburban against urban I don't think is very healthy either. I think that I think that there's got to be a way for conservatives to start really addressing urban issues. Somebody made the joke that 
that conservatives don't talk about social, I think it was you, said that conservatives don't talk about social issues. But I think that that's increasingly what matters to people. Another thing that's, that's fascinating is that if you look at the political jurisdictions, they were drawn during the horse and buggy days. A lot of these things, like the border between North Carolina and South Carolina, one of the reasons why it's so arbitrary you know, in a section around Charlotte is because the British surveyors got drunk <laughs> one night and lost their way and that's why, that's why, that's why North Carolina, South Carolina border looks like straight and then, and then it goes straight again. And we're living, we're living with these legacies. I mean, what's the border between Georgetown and Bethesda, and Rockville and, and McLean? You know, um, a, a lot of these things, if we were drawing the map now, wouldn't be the same that they are. Technology. Um, Americans, I thought that that was a fascinating point that you said about stewardship. And I also thought that that was a really great point that you talked about free markets versus efficiency. Because, and this was one of the things that I kind of wanted to tease out um, in this conversation. I think that there is certain strands of conservatism that seem kind of absolutist. You know, that want to go all the way to red in X or Y category. But it seems to me that if you look at Washington, another Kentucky and Henry Clay, Lincoln, you know, you look at, at some of the touchstones of what I have always thought of were kind of conservatives. <laughs> I might be mistaken, but um, that they had kind of a balanced and limited view of human nature, that they didn't, they didn't trust everything all the way to red. That one of the things that people thought is that, that, that you could structure things. Um, I worked for the US Chamber of Commerce for 15 years. And one of the things people always thought was, oh, you just believe totally in free markets and hate government. And I, my thought was, well, actually, no, you need government to guarantee property rights and also to make markets. Ronald Coase just died, you know, who was one of the inspirations for structuring the market around broadband. I think that, Bill, borrowing, going to your point about this untapped potential of applying kind of market mechanism solutions, and looking at things in alternative strategies is one of the things going forward that's embedded in the idea of distributed networks and, I, and embedded in the idea of empowering individuals and organizations, right? So we're nearing a kind of, well, oh, we've still got a little bit of time. So um, what I'd like to do is kind of drill down into a couple of specific issues. Um, first of all, let's talk about energy and, and the environment. Charlie, um, what did you think when, when Bill was talking about, about climate change? I know you've got a next door neighbor in Chatham who's really wrestling with some real world energy versus environment issues right now. Uh, Stephen's talking about uh, back um, in the 70s and 80s when the natural gas pipeline was uh, dug from, uh, I think from Texas up to maybe New York. Is that, does that sound right? Mm -hmm. uh, Marline uh, was the company. Anyway, they, they, there's a farm uh, in, in, uh, just outside of town where they discovered uranium. And uh, this was all exciting at the time, but then it sort of, uh, people lost interest. Uh, when the price of uranium plummeted, uh, it, came back, it uh, came back in the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. And it is, it's about $10 billion worth of uranium almost exclusively on one farm, and it's uh, largely at the surface. And uh, it has become a, uh, this massive point of, of uh, friction where you have interests from all over coming in. And, uh, and one of the things that, that and, and I get, um, I get the, the concerns, and I, I see why uh, people get upset about the notion of mining something. Uh, even on a, sing, a single person's uh, prop, property, but but I wonder. Uh, I've always wondered about whether or not uh, Republicans have sort of, or conservatives, and I, I don't mean to mix the two. It's just easier to do. Uh, if the that side of the ledger, what, it, if they're not sort of missing an opportunity to talk about uh, being pro and and I'm, I'm consider myself a very pro, and I mean, I, I fish, I hunt, I, you know, I, I love being outside. I spend far more time outside than I think a lot of these uh, env environmental people do. Uh, but, 
uh, I, and I love trees, I plant trees, I go crazy planting trees in my neighborhood, it's <laughs> insane. I mean, literally, my wife has ha had to like, uh, have an intervention because that's, that's I would. Very this, is, this is a true story. He's had the District of Columbia <laughs> <laughs> officials come and ask him to to talk to register when he's going to plant a tree or not. <laughs> No, it's a real problem, and, and, and actually, I, I got into I got into such a fight over because sometimes we plant it, plant trees on other people's property. He's, uh, but you know, it's, it's like he's a, if he's a not, serendipitous if, tree if, planter. If, if they're not paying attention and I get away with it, it's, the, it's not a, it's it's not a big deal in my. And you take a bunch of school kids in the district and say, "Y'all come around here," and we all dig the hole. Everybody walks by. And they think it's so cute. But of course, if I'm doing it by myself, that's when they call the police. <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyway, it's been, uh, but so I consider myself an environmental. I like trees more than people. Uh, but but I, I've always wondered whether or not the, the, the sort of right side of things hasn't sort of missed an important part of, about being pro-environmental environment or whatever uh, in terms of property rights. Yeah. Because the notion that if you, I, I think it's a fair point. If you have a smokestack and a bunch of crud is coming out of your smokestack and it's landing on my property, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of a vested, I have a vested interest in that. And, and that would be the same as if you were throwing stuff over, littering in my, in my yard. And I, and, but, but like you say, you know, the Republicans have sort of uh, run from that. And, and I, it just has always struck me as a, a very powerful like, I should be held responsible for planting a tree in someone else's yard. I think it's totally legitimate that that should be illegal. <laughs> to some degree. And, and, and of course, but the instinct, the instinct on the part of any ideological group is to force their core reality onto the real world. Uh, and of course, their core reality is oversimplified and not real. So when you talk to, talk to environmentalists, they are so passionate about protecting this extraordinary complex uh, system that produces so much value that it's unacknowledged that they want government to come in and slam you know, controls and prevent anything from happening. And the right is so dedicated to this free-flowing economic system that produces so much value that no one acknowledges that they want to come in and slam the environment and say, you know, <clears throat> let's control the environment so we can allow this free-flowing system to, to, uh, to continue to create value. Our point is that these are the same systems, actually, just viewed through different lenses, and that these extraordinary systems of the free market and, nature and natural ecosystems, that's where value comes from. And Republicans need to acknowledge that. If they don't, then the instinct of ideological groups to superimpose their designed perfect society uh, is going to continue. And the, the big government approach is, you know, because of the, the left's tendency to believe that people are good and they'll do good as long as they're not corrupted by evil institutions, they believe that if you put all the power in government, which is not profit-centered, that government will do good and that people will do good in that, in that construct. I understand why they believe that, but it's not true. Uh, the opposite is the case. The right needs to take what they call property rights and translate it into terms that the left can understand. It's absolutely true in free market environmentalism that when you don't have defined property, you have exploitation. We, you know, on the, on the left, on the right, that's very under, understandable. When we work with organizations to stop deforestation in the third world, it's very obvious to us that, the, that one of the driving forces behind deforestation is the fact that nobody has clear land title. And so everybody, when they get access to it, strips it bare as fast as they can and gets, gets out of there. So property rights are key to environmental sustainability, but it's not recognized. The term property rights is, again, offensive to the left because they see it as the same thing as materialism uh, and consumerism and corporate control. So we need to change that language to draw them in. Both of you are making me think that environmentalism is something that conservative thinkers just haven't engaged with enough that they just haven't, they haven't marinated on environmental issues the way that they should. Let me turn to uh, foreign policy and national security. Are conservatives warmongers and, um, <laughs> and, and privacy snoopers? 
I mean, the ironic thing there is that traditionally conservatives have not been uh, the more militaristic party and, or the more mil mil militaristic side of our, um, you know, sort of two-party system. So, I mean, the biggest triumphs of Richard Nixon's foreign policy or of uh, Ronald Reagan's foreign policy were both diplomatic. It was uh, Nixon's opening to China. It was Ronald Reagan's negotiations with Gorbachev. Uh, you know, and many of the disastrous wars that we've had, at least before, um, you know, the Iraq War, Wars like Vietnam were things that had been sort of ginned up by Democrats, by people like Lyndon Johnson. And, you know, the, the left was very clear on that. The left, you know, hated Johnson. Um, somehow the right has been allowed to confuse itself and think that militarism is somehow a conservative principle or something that ought to be uh, defended by the right, which is really not the case. Um, Republicans and conservatives both have good traditions of pursuing the national interest through diplomacy, through economic engagement, and through means other than simply the use of force. Um, but that narrative, I mean, it's been so confused for so long that it's extremely difficult, as, as Bill, I think, had, had mentioned, to kind of break through these preconceptions that people have built up as these walls in their minds. And that's true not only on the left and on the center, but even among the right, there are people who have totally overlooked their own tradition of a more sort of diplomatic and... Um, uh, cautious, prudential uh, foreign policy. And what about in terms of national security? Well, the national security state has been a, a bipartisan construct that has really uh, run roughshod over our liberties. And there it's not so much a matter of left versus right so much as it is a matter of government versus the public. And uh, that's something which is extremely difficult to fix because virtually anyone who gets pulled into government, and now that we, we find this even uh, among you know, various members of Congress, they wind up taking the side of the national security establishment. And so it's only relatively young congressmen, people like Justin Amash, who are not part of the game and who are willing to uh, criticize what's going on. So that is something which I see as not being uh, a left-right issue. And funnily enough, I mean, even if you look at the 1990s, there were Republicans who were not in Washington. There were people like John Ashcroft, um, who was in Washington as a senator, but who still had you know, significant roots in Missouri, who was very critical, in fact, as, uh, as a Missouri senator of uh, some of the invasions of privacy uh, that were being contemplated in the 1990s. You saw a lot of Republicans, in fact, who were against um, some of the, the clipper chip, for example, which was going to be uh, this uh, device within everyone's computers that was going to basically give the NSA a back door. So uh, you did have, in fact, conservatives, but you also had civil libertarians on the left who were very, very concerned about these things. What we've seen happen, however, is that the NSA kind of circumvented the whole political process, and they said, well, even though we didn't get the clipper chip, we're still going to be able to uh, bully industry groups into adopting flawed standards that we'll be able to infiltrate. Uh, we'll be able to uh, go to companies individually and intimidate them into giving us what we want. Um, this is a, a tremendous political abuse. It's bipartisan, and it's something that we really need to build a massive left-right coalition to oppose. So switching gears, because I'm running out of time, sorry, that's why I'm just machine gunning through some of this. Charlie, um, you've written a lot on some of these subjects regarding um, gun violence and race relations. Um, there's, there's a perception out there that conservatives are racist and that conservatives want, don't want to do anything about the culture of violence that's going on. Um, discuss. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's, it's so interesting. <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, this last horrible episode. Uh, I don't know if you all heard. President Obama went and spoke to the, this. Uh, it was a memorial, a funeral of sorts, at the Marine barracks uh, about it. And of course, he launches into the need for gun control. And it, 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 it was just sort of, it was kind of mind blowing that you would actually do that, it politicize something at a memorial service, but that's just, I guess, the manners that some of us were taught. But, uh, but in any event, uh, the, I think it's interesting um, how uh, this is, by and large, other than him, really, this has, the, 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 there's been no traction in this latest episode uh, for gun control. And of course, the reason is, is because you know, the guy used the most rudimentary sort of uh, shotgun used for sh hunting birds and, you know, I mean, it's the last thing you would arm yourself for with if you were, if you were going to do something like this. And it's an amazing, it, you know, it's shocking, the lack of security. It's stunning that, uh, that he was, got, managed to get away with this on a military installation. And one of our 
good guys wasn't there and able to take him out before he <coughs> took out 12 people. It's just staggering to me. Um, and, and then, you know, you can't really, what is the argument you're going to make? We need to disarm the military? You know, it's it just, uh, it, it, it in so many ways put a fallacy to what I would say has been the argument after every single one of these things. Um, but, uh, and while the other issues like the violence and something else that, again, I, I don't want to tick anybody off, but the business about these, the psychotropic medications and drugs, um, while that has not gotten huge play, it has gotten more play now than it has in any one of these other episodes, you know, after that insanity in Colorado in that movie theater, um, where clearly you had a guy who was on a lot of different chemicals, and, um, but you simply are not allowed to have a conversation about it. I think largely because it, you know, that medicine is very mainstream. People in my business, a lot of people on my business are on it, and probably the other half ought to be on it. <laughs> and uh, but but so the, it's very touchy. It's a, you're not allowed to talk about this stuff. And while I certainly take, yeah, I would never dismiss the issue of brain problems and, and you know mental uh, you know needing solutions to mental issues. I, I, why we're not having a serious conversation about these drugs? Um, and then, and then, of course, then the other thing is the business about the uh, video games, uh, which I also call mass murder simulator machines, uh, and and why young. I mean, I would never, I would never let my children play you, one you of these never, things. You never hear conservative voices really talking about the culture of violence because it seems like guns and the second, the second Amendment is like this. And then the culture of violence because is they're, like, because they're so afraid of 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 having the conversation co-opted. And you know, you, you you were talking about how crazy it is that these lines are drawn back in the Stone Ages. Well, you know, thank God they were, and thank God for the states because if it weren't for states and the way the states are made up, the Senate would no telling what the Senate. And and at the end of the day, I care about two things: taxes and guns. For me personally. Uh, and you know the I, if you the idea that you would touch my Second Amendment rights it, it scares me more than anything. And the only thing that protects me from that is the crazy makeup of the Senate, even though it's de the Democrats that control it now. But well, I mean, Charlie, you would have been pretty much in line with every patriot in 1776 because that's basically what they were fighting the british yeah. about were those two things i mean you're touching into deep 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 american traditions there bill one of one of the things that vexes a lot of conservatives is that when they talk about social issues mm -hmm. and they they try and say you know um there's right and wrong there's morality you know etc that they have been cast as bigots, they've been cast as narrow-minded, mm -hmm. exclusionary, et cetera. Um, what, what advice would you give for people who have like real deep moral convictions about whatever issue it is that they have, mm -hmm. about how to talk about those, those issues um, in a constructive way? How, how can I be understood? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I do have a real, real issue, and I know, and I know it may conflict with what somebody else believes, yeah. but I still want to be, I still want to work with them on mm -hmm. nine, you know, seventy percent of the other things. How do, how do I, am I, am I able to hold my moral stance yeah. and still be able to to work with folks? I think you you need to engage and listen. And as you engage and listen, you learn how to, how to express what's deeply and passionately important to you. Uh, this is key, and <clears throat> you know, we have to remind ourselves of this every time we're speaking with, uh, with a stakeholder. We need to listen first. If we listen first, they share what they're passionately interested in. And we have to translate what they're passionate about into the underlying principles that are legitimate. Because we not, may not share the objective that they have, the specific you know, way that they want to get to that, to that point. But once they express what they're passionate about, we almost always discover that we 
are passionate about that also. We just may have a better way of getting there or a different way of getting there. So I think we have to engage first of all. It breaks the demonization process. We have to listen second because you can't, as I said earlier, uh, they won't uh, uh, understand, uh, 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 they won't care what you know until they know that you care. They won't care what you know until they know that you care. You have to listen to them, validate what's important to them, and then express what's important to you, and then you can bring them together. So amazingly enough, and I knew this would happen, the time has just flown like that. Um, what I'd like to do is is kind of end this this conversation with kind of what are one or two takeaways that you've gotten from the conversation, and also what you know, if there was one thing that you would want people to think about coming out of it from your perspective, what would they be? And Bill, starting, starting with you. I was afraid you were going to do that. So, I think the, the tendency to instantly demonize is something that we need to intellectually separate ourselves from. We deal with, with demonizing conflicts every day between corporations and activist groups. We know that we're dealing with a narrative that is perpetuated by the media and by instincts that are embedded in us tribally, uh, that we have a tendency to form tribes very quickly and to define the alternate tribe as the evil force because it allows us to close our minds, uh, deny their humanity, and kill them. <laughs> and this is a tribal instinct that we bring into politics, and it works functionally. We're not going to convince the parties, the activist groups, and others to stop demonizing. But what we have to do is acknowledge that it's a tactic, not a reality. That, that demonization, unfortunately, works in politics, and it works in the media, and it works in activism, and people are going to use it pragmatically. But we have to recognize that it's only a tactic, that it's a regrettable tactic, that it isn't based on reality, that the opposition is not evil, that the evil people are not the problem. It's the good people who are trapped in ideologies that are limiting that's the problem. The evil people, you know, we separate them out you know, pretty easily because they're evil. Uh, uh, but the good people are the ones that live inside these mental shells that have to be broken. And it's bringing those sides together that is the key. Opportunities like this that bring together different strands of the right and that inject uh, progressive ideas into the discussion as well are key. And opportunities like this to bring together the left and the right to recognize that they are all being manipulated not by evil you know, corporate and government interests, but by the tendency of all institutions to support what will embed their the power. The status quo. To, impo to support the status quo. We're all part of the status quo. There are no, there are very few, if there are any, evil corporations or evil government agencies, despite you know, popular sentiment. There are good people doing things that advance their interests and their institutional interests. And we all have to, at some point, get together and say, our institutional interests collectively are tying us down and forcing us to stay in the past. And the collective dead wood on the ground is going to lead to a fire like we have in Southern California that's going to take down the system if we're not able to, to, to clear that dead wood. Great. Charlie, takeaways from the conversation and takeaways you want to leave us yeah. with. Um, I, I think it's fascinating uh, what Bill was talking about, the need for, like, e even on really pitted adversaries like environmentalists uh, versus, uh, you know, some of the people they take on to engage in, in, in discussion and that there's probably more uh, uh, common ground there than either side would have guessed. Um, and, I, and I think that one of the really great things, one of the scary things about all of this, you know, modern technology and this ability to communicate at dizzying speeds uh, with people that we never even knew existed out there uh, because of all this, you know, obviously the negative part is the NSA stuff, which is, and the snooping, and, and, and uh, of course, you're exactly right about the need to, uh, th there has to be a collective outrage against it. Um, but the good side of it is that um, it does disenfranchise a lot of the establishment. It, it, people in my business, you know, the, the press is just completely neutered by uh, all this new to ways of communicating with people 
uh, and uh, it's, it's how people get a Twitter account and then three weeks later they'll have like a million people on it or something just because they happen to have been sort of standing in the right place and having the, the right ideas. And it's that, uh, going back to the Federalist Papers, the multiplicity of faction that is, that I think is a very positive, it's scary, uh, but I think it's very positive and I think that the more people on, that believe in free market and stuff like that engage in it, the better it is. Dan, what about you? Takeaways? Well, I think I would em emphasize two themes that have uh, been discussed uh, throughout the panel. Um, one of them, which I might kind of sharpen, uh, is that conservatism has to be a philosophy of the whole. It can't simply be the philosophy of one particular region, one particular faction, one particular kind of person, one particular sect. It has to have a, a sort of broad-mindedness for the nation as a whole. Now, that doesn't mean that within that broad-mindedness, every element is going to be weighted equally. Uh, it means that one has to think very dynamically about how to achieve uh, you know, a good for everyone, even when you have these very disparate elements. So that kind of conservatism, conservative pluralism I think is absolutely essential. And one element of that is addressing these problems that are raised and that arise uh, from sides that we don't normally think of as being uh, sympathetic to us. So Bill has made some very good points, for example, about the need for conservatives to take seriously the environmental concerns uh, that so many on the left have, have uh, you know, brought up. Uh, that really is part of having this conservatism of the whole. And then the second thing I would say, which also I think reflects uh, what we've heard uh, throughout the panel, is that the existing narrative and the existing uh, stereotypes uh, really work against conservatives very powerfully right now. There was a time maybe, you know, maybe even 10 years ago, certainly maybe 20 years ago, when a lot of the stereotypes about maybe 60s radicals or about uh, Democrats being, uh, you know, uh, a party of total disorganization. There was a time when the political stereotypes worked very, very well for conservatives. And that was a moment of transition and change for the conservative movement. It's when Ronald Reagan was able to come to power. It's when we had the Republican takeover of the House and the uh, Senate. Um, that has all shifted under our feet. And we're still fighting in terms that were basically drawn up in the 1970s, even though that paradigm has now, it doesn't, it doesn't correspond to reality anymore. And as a result, we have this fixed narrative that is working against us, and we're constantly reinforcing it. I mean, I think Charlie brought up very well the uh, defects with uh, Ted Cruz's plan right now. Ted Cruz is reinforcing this idea of conservatives as obstructionists, as people who are more concerned with um, sort of a pyrotechnic display than with actually achieving legislative reform or delay in this case. Um, and, and that's uh, counterproductive. Um, you know, it's perfectly clear why he's doing it. It's perfectly clear why so many people will give him money to keep doing it. But it's completely destructive as well. It's reinforcing a narrative uh, that is now counterproductive. And there's a need to completely change it to sort of get the chessboard and just throw it up in the air, let the pieces come down in a new configuration and play from there. Well, thank you all very much. I think that, that you summed up um, some of the trends really, really well. It, it really does sound to me, Bill, that part of your critique is that conservatives are not engaging enough with some of these issues that really are important to society as a whole. And, um, and that it might make sense to kind of do a survey or something to understand which are, which are the issues where it might make sense for conservative thinkers to really start drilling in and, and doing more with them. You know, Charlie, um, uh, aside from the idea that if I want to plant a, a tree on the slide, I should take a lot of kids to go with me, um, I, I think that what you're talking about a little bit is that you're looking for leadership. And it, seems, and it seems to me like that there's a lack of clarity about leadership and a lack of clarity about message was seen. At least, that's, at least that's what I'm, uh, is coming through. And Dan, uh, one, of, one of the things I think that is important here is that we not fight the last war. And it, and it strikes me that, that I'm not hearing you doing, uh, criticizing the principles of conservatism, though I, I do agree with whoever said that there, just seem, there does seem to be a lack of clarity about what those principles are, that there does seem to be a little bit of a debate about them. But that, but that it's important to, to get the frame right to get the fact sets right so that you can apply your principles in, uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a positive direction here. From my, from my perspective, um, I think that you can tell that, that my belief is, is that we're in an intermediate time. We're in a grinding time 
moving towards a new construct and that we haven't we haven't totally socialized the ideas yet to get ourselves to to a new framework a new template but one of the things that has to happen in order to get to kind of a new concept about where we're going is that you have to have conversations and dialogues like this you have to you have to be able to like start putting th putting issues on the table and you have to start being able to map out uh, what are the, the possible areas that we're not hitting directly? What are the areas that we're overemphasizing at the expense of, of where we need to go? And, and really, it's a, it's a process of discovery and a process of, of um, I would say, socialization, saying, okay, here's an issue. How do, we, how do we really start to address it? So I thought that this was a fascinating survey. I really appreciate all of your perspectives and very complimentary. Um, how this how this ended up working out. Now I'm going to to oh and so with that please join me in applauding our our wonderful panel here. With that I'm going to turn it back over to Bill Shireman and and Nick Sorrentino to explain the logistics for the rest of the program. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to welcome you to lunch. We're going to do lunch. Nick, if you can come up and explain the explain, explain the logistics. I believe halfway through lunch, we're going to begin a little uh, cross discussion as well. And then, of course, at 1 o'clock, we begin the next session on uh, the young and, and how to earn their support uh, in the future. Meanwhile, I encourage you to engage. Talk to us if you want to continue this process. We don't do meetings at Future 500. We do processes that lead to change. And so this is not just a discussion that will go nowhere or just be recorded. This is a process that, that we intend to carry forward toward change. So any of you that are interested in participating in that process, please do leave us, any of us, Dana here in the, in the red, uh, Nick here or myself, leave your business cards, let us know that you're interested, let us know of anything in particular you're interested in, and we will be very pleased to follow through.